even if you did well in PA school, even if you smoked your EORs and you did well on the pack rat and you did well on your EOC and all of that, but suddenly, like a week before the exam, it's like that never happened. It all just goes out the window and you're like, oh man, what's about to happen? I don't know anything. I'm so nervous. I was so terrified about this exam. And you're very, very worried about passing the pants. Just like know that you're not the only one. You're not alone. You can't get out of your seat until you basically wave at the camera and say like, hey, I'm done with my section. You know, I'm ready for my break. The assessments are actually valid. The assessments that you take all the way through PA school, your test scores during first year, your end of rotation exams during second year, your clinical pack rat that you take kind of like in the middle, maybe end of clinical year, very accurate. And they should predict your PAN score quite well. Hey guys, I'm Boris. I'm a certified physician assistant. That's right, if you watched this channel before, you're used to me saying I'm a PA student, I'm a first year PA student, I'm a second year PA student. That's over, I've graduated PA school, I passed the pants, I got my New York State license to practice medicine as a physician assistant in the state of New York. So that's it, I'm now officially a PA. So now at long last, you know, two years after I made this channel, the channel Boris the PA is legit. I'm actually a PA now, I'm no longer a PA student. Another thing you might notice, if you're used to any of my car videos with really crappy audio, I got this little microphone. So I know I should just be recording at home with my camera and my nice microphone, but sorry, I've been busy. And sometimes when the motivation strikes me and I'm on a long trip, like I am right now, I'm going from Cleveland where my parents live to Columbus where my, uh, my sister lives. And so I got two hours on the road, tired of listening to music. So I thought I'd make a little video for all of you guys all about the day I took my pants and maybe a little bit about like leading up to the pants but that might be a separate video I don't know we'll see where this takes us and we'll also see how good the audio is again I might just toss the video anyway I'll quit rambling I just wanted to give you guys that quick update yes I did pass the pants yes PA school is over and yes I got a job I'm gonna start the day after Thanksgiving weekend is over so November 29th my first day on the job I can't freaking wait it's like my dream job but anyway more on that later right now let's talk about the pants so the pants the PA physician assistant national certifying exam I think that's what it stands for is the big test you know five hours 300 questions uh, five blocks of 60 questions each uh, the big exam that you have to take after PA school is over in order to actually be a certified PA so you graduate PA school you know you are a PA you can put that after your name you know, Boris Temkin, PA. But what you really want is that C, PAC, certified. And you only get that by passing the pants. And that's what you need in order to practice, teach, whatever it is you wanna do as a physician assistant, you know, you gotta be certified. So anyway, it's kind of a big deal. You have to take this test. In fact, your entire PA school, like training, your entire curriculum, everything that happens during PA school, is basically geared towards training you to take this giant, important exam. Everything. And if you think about it, at least the good PA programs like mine, excellent PA program at Lemoyne College, every single program that's good at least, basically is designed to train you to take this test. So eventually you start getting test questions, you have like a minute per question, and they try to simulate like the difficulty and the language and the timing basically just getting you ready to take this exam because that's the important thing and that's also kind of how PA schools are measured is their first time pants pass rate how what percentage what proportion of the class uh, passed the pants on their first try so I think my school had hundred percent the last couple of years I could be mistaken it's definitely in the 90s and above but I think it's been a hundred and I'm not sure what it is this year yet I'm hoping it's a hundred you know I'm hoping all my classmates uh, pass the pants on their first try because it's really stressful if you don't pass it. So anyway, just happy to contribute to that 100%. If uh, if we did end up getting the 100%, I'm just stoked that I got it, you know, on my first try. Like most people do. You know, it's a big deal, but it's also, it's not unique. Most people do pass this thing on their first try. So, that being said, that does not mean the exam is easy. It is not. It is not an easy exam. It's probably the hardest test I've ever taken. Probably the hardest test I've ever taken. Definitely the longest. 
And so I'm not gonna talk about like what the test entails. You can find a million YouTube videos about that. But what I will tell you is my exact experience. So these tests are taken at what's called a Pearson View Testing Center. And there's like hundreds of them all over the country, maybe thousands. And these testing centers are basically just made to deliver official tests like these and like all kinds of other exams. So you might be in there with like five, 10 other people taking all different exams, taking their breaks at different times and stuff like that. So it's not just all people taking the pants. That's important to know. Another thing is these testing centers could be set up in all kinds of different ways. So there could be like noise, there could be distractions, there could be different bathroom policies. Uh, the bathroom might be like a five minute walk away from the testing center, or it might be just a little 30 second, you know, walk away from where you're taking your test. And that's important because you get five breaks. And so you might want to plan and think about how you're going to use your brakes. And if you have to walk further for the bathroom, for instance, you might want to think about that versus like a 30 second walk like I had at my center. Just little stuff that maybe you don't think about. You think that you're going to get there and you're just going to take this test. Like, okay, you should probably plan ahead. So anyway, my testing center was at a public library. And so it was, I was alone in the room for like, I think the first three hours. And then there was another girl in there, like the last two hours of my exam. Like I said, the bathroom was a really quick walk away. You get in there, there's lockers for all your stuff. You're allowed to bring like food and water and basically that's it. You're not, not allowed to have your phone or I think you might be, but it has to be off. So you may as well just leave it in the car just in case. Um, you're not really allowed to have anything else. No smartwatches, nothing like that. So you get in there, you lock up your stuff, you get your little key and then, you know, you go sign in to your computer and then you sit down and then the test begins. There's like a little, uh, Sorry, these windshield wipers are loud. Um, there's like a little intro section. They kind of tell you how the exam is. They tell you how to use the software, which basically you should already know because you've taken so many practice tests on the same kind of software. But basically you have to click through all that and then you know your test begins. Five sections, 60 questions each, one minute per question. So you have up to five hours with a total of up to I think 45 minutes of breaks. So if you do the math, that's like a little over 10 minutes per break you're allowed to take. You know, you take one section, take 10 minutes, take section two, take 10, uh, take 10 minutes, and so on and so forth. So you can have like 11 minutes or so per break uh, if you really calculate that out. I didn't take anywhere near that. I think I got out, you know, ate a snack at every single break, took a bathroom break at every single break, even if I didn't need to. You know, it's like my worst nightmare having to go to the bathroom halfway through a test section and like having that distract you. That's like my worst nightmare. So like I made sure I went to the bathroom just in case, even if I didn't need to. Uh, so might be TMI, but it's what I did. Anyway, uh, so the test center, you don't really have much interaction with the person proctoring your exam until you're ready to take your break. And that's like, you're on camera the whole time, by the way. So they're watching you, they're listening to you, make sure you don't have like notes scribbled on your hand or anything, you're not cheating. Because this is a seriously serious exam. I mean like your license to practice medicine is dependent on you passing this exam. So if there's any fraud whatsoever, like it is a big, big deal. So these test centers are really strict. They got you on camera, they got you on microphone. You can't get out of your seat until you basically wave at the camera and say like, hey, I'm done with my section, you know, I'm ready for my break. And it feels like forever as you're sitting there like waving at the camera like, hey, all right, I'm ready. I only have 10 minutes for this break. I've got to eat. I've got to pee. I've got to stretch. I've got to get my mind right between sections. And like, you know, the person might take a minute to get to you, but that minute feels like an hour. You're like, man, I just want to get this break and then get ready for my next section. Basically, that's what you got to do. You're like glued to your seat until they release you. It's that strict. So anyway, that was my experience. Not really sure if anyone's interested to hear in any of that, but what you might be interested to hear is how was the exam? What was it like? So obviously I can't give you any questions or even like topics or anything like that. Like we're strictly prohibited from talking about anything remotely what's on the test, but I can give you some comparisons. So if you're a pre-PA, you're not in PA school yet, this may not make a whole lot of sense to you. If you're already a PA student, depending on where you are in your training, this is gonna make a whole lot of sense to you and will hopefully give you a lot of comfort, okay? So if you're like me, or if you're like any other, you know, highly neurotic PA student who knows they have to pass this exam, you know, the week before, two weeks before this exam, you're like on Google, you're on Reddit, you're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever. You're just trying to get any insight whatsoever about what this exam is like. 
you know, you've been preparing for it for two years or three years, however long your program is. You've been tested. You've had all kinds of like examinations that are supposed to simulate it. You know, the PAC rat, the end of curriculum exam, all your exams in PA school, your end of rotation exams, all this stuff that's supposed to simulate it. But suddenly, like a week before the exam, it's like that never happened. It all just goes out the window and you're like, oh man, what's about to happen? I don't know anything. I'm so nervous. I was so terrified about this exam. Like anyone who's taken the pants knows exactly what I'm saying. And you know how terrifying it is. Even if you did well in PA school, even if you smoked your EORs and you did well on the pack rat and you did well on your EOC and all of that. And I'm not saying I did. I was like average, you know, middle of the pack on most of my exams. Um, I didn't fail any EORs. I failed, I think, one exam where I had to remediate one exam in PA school. Uh, but, like, I was a pretty average student in PA school. You know, some things I dominated, I smoked, and some things I just, like, really struggled and held on, you know, by my fingernails, skin of my teeth, as people say. Uh, so I was a pretty average student, you know, and I had a pretty average pants score, uh, as it turns out. So I guess what I'm saying with that big, long-winded comparison is the assessments, the pack rats, your grades in PA school if you have a good program, um, the end of curriculum exam, all of that, your EORs, your end of rotation exams, I found that the pants was actually quite similar to all those things. So I'd say like question wise, the pack rat, it was probably most similar to that. Obviously it was longer. And uh, for me personally, I found the end of curriculum exam to be much easier than the pack rat. Excuse me. I did quite well on the EOC. I did pretty average on the pack rat and I did pretty average on the pants. So, I mean, take that for what you will. I thought the EOC was easier. Um, I thought the EOC was valuable, the end of curriculum exam, just because it was set up exactly like the pants. You know, it was, uh, it was proctored the same way by your program. It was five hours, you know, five sections of 60 questions, just like the pants. So just like getting through that really long exam and knowing that I had the stamina to last and do that, that was comforting. But as far as the level of the questions on the EOC, I personally thought they were much easier than on the pants. The difficulty of the pants questions I thought was pretty comparable to the pack rat. Uh, so I'm not like promising anything, but if you did well on your pack rat, you know, you're like middle of the road, right around the national average, you'll probably be fine on the pants. And I think that's kind of the, uh, like the thesis of this whole video is the assessments are actually valid. The assessments that you take all the way through PA school, your test scores during first year, your end of rotation exams during second year, your clinical pack rat that you take kind of like in the middle, maybe end of clinical year, very accurate. And they should predict your, um, and they should predict your PAN score quite well. And then especially if you do something like Roche review and you do it like the way it's supposed to be done, you know, you do the clinical question bank, those 3,300 questions or something, and you take it in test mode, all of it, you know, obviously not at the same time, you're not gonna sit down and take 3,000 questions. But if you take it in test mode, you know, in little chunks and you actually use it as an assessment, they predict your pants score and they give you like a, you know, a, a percentage of uh, how likely you are to pass, but they predict your score. And I found that to be very, uh, very accurate as well. So between the EOC, the uh, pack rats, your EORs, and then the Roche review predicted score, if you're passing, especially like if you're passing with flying colors, with all that, again, I can't promise anything. I don't know if you have test anxiety. I don't know what kind of headspace you'll be in, what kind of mood you'll be in, but with pretty good likelihood, I should tell you, or I should be able to tell you, you'll probably be fine on the pants if you're fine on all of those things. Now, I know not everybody is. As John Belisky says, you know, PA students come in three categories green light, meaning you've just like smoked everything your whole career. You've done well through first year. You didn't remediate anything. You've been getting really good grades. Uh, you kicked butt on all the EORs. You had a great pack rat score. EOC knocked it out of the park. Everything like, okay, nobody's worried about you. You're probably worried because you know, you're a grad student and you, that's how you got this far is by worrying about your grades. But like you're a green light student, you're fine. Yellow light students, which if I'm honest with myself, I was probably somewhere between yellow light and green light uh, my whole time in PA school. Now I had a lot of like really, really unfortunate stressors that came up, especially during clinical year. Um, some family stuff, some personal stuff that I'm just, 
I don't know. I might share with you guys at some point, um, but I'm not going to share right now. I just, it's not the time. Uh, but anyway, so, I mean, if it wasn't for those things and I had like a kind of normal, stable grad school experience, like I think most people do, I feel like I would have been, you know, green light all the way. I would have done much better overall. Uh, but like I said, despite all that stuff, I was a pretty average student. So I'd say like yellow light to green light is where, uh, where I was. And I also know that's not everybody's experience. I know some people might be red light, like they are hanging on for dear life their whole time in PA school. You know, they're remediating exams during the first year. They're struggling with their EORs. Maybe they failed one, maybe they failed two. They're like right on the cusp of possibly getting dismissed. Uh, from the program or having to repeat the first year like those people exist too i don't want to ignore those people and those people make very good pas possibly you know so like just because you don't do great during the didactic you know portion of pa school or you're not a great test taker doesn't mean you're not going to be a pa and it doesn't mean you're not going to be an awesome pa that like your patients love and that you know does really good work for their community absolutely not that's bs like just because you're not good at school doesn't mean you're not going to be a good provider. And I want, <clears throat> excuse me, am I getting emotional about this? I'm getting emotional about this. <laughs> or maybe I have a cough. Um, I did just get over COVID a few weeks ago. But anyway, anybody who is like one of those red light people, like I want you to know that just hang in there. Just hang on for dear life. It's only two years. You're going to make it. If you have to freaking repeat you know, first year, or if you have to repeat some tests, remediate, if you have to take the pants twice or three times, like that happens. People do that all the time. And those people come out at the end as, you know, stronger for the experience and they become great PAs and they have a long, thriving, awesome, lucrative career where they do great work and they help their communities. And, you know, they make a great life for themselves and for their family. So if you happen to be one of those red light people, you know, I feel for you. I like, I don't think I personally was one of those red light folks, like for most of the year anyway, like there definitely were times when I, uh, when some things got to me and I kind of probably got pushed to that category. Um, so I know what it's like to uh, fail an exam and be terrified. I know what it's like to almost fail an end of rotation exam and be terrified because it's right there in your PA school contract. You know, you fail two of these, you're dismissed. You're dismissed from the program. So we don't care that, you know, it's taken you 10 years to get here. You fail two of these, you're out. You're done. Good luck. And if you happen to have 100 grand in student loans from this program, you know, double good luck. You're screwed. Um, so my point is, I know what it's like to like stare that in the face and know that, um, you know, everything you worked for could possibly go away because of a bad test grade or because of, you know, something else. Uh, so it, it is terrifying, but the good thing about things that are terrifying and that scare us to death and where we see our whole life like flash before our eyes, our whole career, the whole future that we built flash before our eyes, um, when you see that possibly being taken away just like that, you get better. You get better as a person, you get better as a student, you get better as, I said person, but just as a person, you know, you get, you eat your humble pie with whipped cream and sometimes you go back for a second helping and get more humble pie you know that it makes you a better person and you know it makes you a better provider to uh to kind of like have the fear of god in you a little bit i'm getting totally off track my point is if you happen to be you know a red light student and you're very very worried about passing the pants just like know that you're not the only one you're not alone there's other people that have been in that category their whole time in PA school, and they came out ahead, they came out in the end, and they're PAs now. Um, and then there's people like me that, you know, have kind of flirted with that category a little bit, you know, have seen it and uh, know what it's like, but haven't necessarily been there their whole PA school career. And, you know, then there's people that, you know, can't imagine what's that, what that's like because they're just, you know, excellent students and, you know, good on them. You know, that's awesome. I strive to be more like that. We all should. So, you know, I guess the point is we're all in this together. Uh, but anyway, I'm totally off track. I should probably end this video. And I also saw a little sign that said, um, it's like 40 miles to Columbus. So I should probably turn my GPS back on so I don't get lost. I'm visiting my sister and my niece. 
uh, right now. I freaking can't wait. I never see them. Like, I almost never see them. Yeah, and my niece is five years old. She's, like, growing up, and, you know, it's going to be nice to see her. Uh, but anyway. Man, I'm totally off track. I think that's all I wanted to say, I guess. Just tell you guys about my, uh, my experience with the pants. Tell you I passed. I'm certified. I'm licensed. I'm ready to go. If anyone has any specific questions about the pants, you know, ask away in the comments or, you know, shoot me a DM on Instagram. I reply to all those. Uh, I might take a little bit sometimes, but I, I usually reply. Uh, yeah, I'll probably make a lot more videos about this kind of thing. It's just been really crazy lately, like finishing up, you know, PA school, studying for the pants, uh, trying to like take these couple months off after PA school ended and just like traveling, seeing friends, seeing family, just doing some reading, trying to like unwind and like remember who the heck I am as a person, you know, that like this last year just totally just pushed aside and kind of took away for a while. So like, it's just, it's, it's a good, uh, it's a good break and it's a good idea to take some time after PA school's over to just like chill, see everybody, unwind, read some books, try to sleep in, you know, get some exercise, just like, just chill. Try not to jump into a job right away. I know you got student loans, you know, just like burning a giant red sign in front of your face saying, hey, pay me, pay me, you know, you owe 100 grand, you owe 200 grand, but I don't know, if, if it's possible for you, try to wait a little bit before jumping into a job, you know, and starting your future. Um, I'm definitely excited to start my job. I can't wait to like actually be a PA and do all this stuff, but like it, it's been, it's been freaking magical just being able to like travel a little bit, see my friends that I haven't seen forever, see my family I haven't seen for a long time, and just, you know, not being school, not be working. Yeah, I'm gonna quit rambling. Thank you guys for watching. Hopefully the audio was okay. Um, yeah, much more to come about the pants, about the end of PA school, about all kinds of stuff, about my new job. I'm also going to be kind of shifting the uh, the channel's focus a little bit away from PA school um, into my you know actual work and life and passion, which is uh, medical weight loss and you know fitness and things like that, because that's kind of the field I'll be working in internal medicine as well as medical weight loss. But anyway, more to come. Thank you guys for watching. Have a great day.